Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, invitation here on this historical day. Uh, what is a little bit uh, for, I know that every year there is naturally uh, festivities in, uh, in Berlin, in Germany, in Europe, on the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, but this time are special because for the first time in history, I think we can celebrate that the wall has been gone for a longer period of time than it was erected. That is the first time uh, that this is the case, that it is uh, 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 a longer period that we, uh, that, uh, we share is this than uh, the fact that the wall has uh, existed. Now, I want to tell you my personal story, uh, what uh, happened uh, that uh, day. Um, um, I remember it very well. The first thing what I did uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, well, it was very simple. I took a plane and I flew to Eastern Europe, uh, to Hungary, to East Germany, to Prague, to Bucharest, uh, all parts of Europe that I, as a liberal politician, was in fact uh, not allowed to visit in the past. Uh, that was not done for a liberal political leader uh, at a time. For the simple reason, ladies and gentlemen, that we liberals got no comrades uh, at the other side of the Iron uh, Curtain. And that looks, in fact, very silly uh, today, that parts uh, of uh, the European continent were inaccessible for politicians because of their political conviction. And I remember me very well when the news broke of uh, the fall of the wall, that, the, that was the improvised press conference by one of the Eastern German party leaders, uh, you remember the name certainly, uh, Gunter Schabowski, uh, who answered to a question uh, of an Italian journalist, uh, put in broken German, about the new contested travel arrangement for the citizens of the DDR, of the GDR. And Schabowski stuttered, and declared every GDR citizen free to cross the border. So that was mainly translated uh, from German uh, what he stuttered. And that was at, I think, 1857 in the evening. And by midnight, masses of Eastern, Europe, uh, Eastern German people, Eastern German citizens, gathered at the border and started to crossing it after this uh, announcement by Schabowski. Well, I can tell you when I saw the images on my television screen, I was overcome by a kind of, uh, how I, uh, can I call it, an euphoria that I have uh, never since experienced again in, in my political career. I, I suddenly felt compelled to travel to the East for the first time in my life, as soon as possible. And that's what I did, because history was being written there, uh, something comparable, that was my feeling at the moment, comparable with the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and uh, my feeling was we needed to be there immediately, physically, side by side, uh, with kindred spirits, instead of uh, here in the West, passively starring at our uh, television screens. So we hastily organized a mission to the Eastern Bloc countries to size up the situation, and then more importantly, to make contact with uh, our brothers, the, the, the numerous uh, liberal and democratic parties that were shooting up everywhere, that were often old movements, political movements, that were returning from exile, uh, but also entirely new political parties and movements springing up of their own accord. So we mapped out in a few days an entire route. Uh, we would start at the furthest point where Democrats, uh, in fact, needed the most help, and that was in Romania. And then the route should go to Hungary, the, the Czechoslovakia, and the returning uh, to uh, Eastern Germany. And uh, we would end in East Berlin to cross the wall back uh, uh, to the West. My journey to the first stage, to Bucharest, uh, I have to tell you, was a deep physical experience. Uh, because over three hours on a flight with Tarom, at that moment, uh, Tarom, uh, the Romanian state airline in its heyday that was more or less 20 centimeters of legroom. So this morning to Berlin, it was a little bit better uh, with uh, Brussels Airlines. And it was for me my first painful introduction to the material world of the old communist single party state. 
The visit to uh, Bucharest uh, itself was even more awful, I have to tell you. The city looked like a, a, a dilapidated theater with wide uh, avenues, high-rise uh, ostentatious uh, facades that uh, concealed not houses, but slums. And in the center of the city lay the megalomaniac presidential palace of uh, Ceausescu that you all know, an awful building, I find it, that in my eyes only deserves to be knocked down. And in the city itself, we saw beggars in the streets, we saw prostitutes in the bar of the hotel, and I have to tell you, with increasing astonishment, I wondered, in fact, how anyone could have ever have faith in the blessings of the communist utopia. The only warm welcome in Bucharest came from uh, the historical leader of the PNL, that is uh, one of the Romania's oldest democratic uh, parties, uh, now back in power uh, in the actual um, government, new government in Romania. Uh, who had remained, uh, that was Mr. Campiano, in exile since the communists took power. He had just returned from Paris. And I have to tell you, due to the sheer poverty of his surroundings, he was sitting in, I remember it very well, in an, an enormous huge office. And in this enormous huge office, there was nothing, only a small kitchen table and a crooked chair. So the first thing we did was to send him a truck full of state-of-the-art office equipment, stencil duplicator machines, and the first-generation computers. A cargo that was completely destroyed shortly afterwards by the stormtroopers of interim president Iliescu. So we have to send a second truck, which even included at that moment a broadcast equipment to set up a private radio station that became radio contact. It would remain in the air in Bucharest <laughs> for over 10 years. So after Bucharest, uh, Budapest was the next stage, was a breath of fresh air, I have to tell you. It was like a return to civilization, uh, to European culture and modern societies. You have to know for decades, in fact, the wall and the Iron Curtain have given us the impression that there were, in fact, two Europes, totally different. Uh, fully distinct, not only politically, but also uh, culturally. And that was a false impression, as here was a city that had everything that made Europe great in the 19th and the early 20th century. Art Nouveau, Art Deco, uh, modernism. And just arrived, we were mopped in the lobby of the hotel by a series of, of larger and smaller political movements, think tanks, parties, action groups, NGOs, who shared a common interest in preaching freedom and democracy. And there were suddenly, in that lobby of that hotel, dozens of them, which was quite remarkable in countries where only a short time before, there was apparently universal acceptance of the single party illiberal communist state. It's there that after our meeting with uh, SDS, that was a democratic movement led by Hungarian intellectuals like uh, Peter Esterhazy, uh, Imre Kertes, and uh, Georg Konrad, uh, who died uh, a few uh, months ago, as you know, that I met for the first time a, a flamboyant young man of roughly my age who introduced him as Viktor Orban. He and a few of his companions explained to me that they, Fides, Fides that means in fact a youth organization of the SDS, huh? it's, still their, uh, it's still their name, were actually the student branch of SDS, but uh, as they didn't receive enough favorable positions on the candidate list, they had decided to participate with a separate list in the upcoming elections, independently from the mother party. I told uh, this Orban has guts a student organization rebelling against the big mother party. I myself had the habit of treating on the tools of my own older party leaders, but I have never submitted my own candidate lists. As to the question of whether Fidesz candidates would be elected, I had some serious doubts about it. But I was mistaken. Fidesz made an impressive debut, uh, debut uh, in the first three Hungarian elections after the fall of the Iron Curtain. They got uh, 21 members elected in these first elections, free elections in Hungary. And in the elections nine years later, Fidesz outperformed SDS, the mother party, 
completely, 148 seats against 28. And at the age of 35, Orban became the youngest prime minister his country had ever had. He started to reform the country's rotten administration. He brought uh, the spiraling inflation under control. And he jump-started the economy with tax cuts. And during his first term of office, Orban also introduced maternity leave, completed the pension reform, reformed health care and agriculture policy. So in a certain way, he was a role model to who we, liberals, looked up. Until the electoral tide turned against him, and he lost the elections in 2002. That can happen in a democracy, as you know. Not an unusual thing to happen in the former Eastern Bloc in these days, on the contrary, because the changeover of power at every election was practically the rule at that time. You remember that. In the Czech Republic, in Poland, in Slovakia, in Hungary, each and every time, the citizens in these countries were disappointed in the political parties that they had elected to power just a few years before. No single party ever held into power for more than four years. But Orban did not see it that way. He joined opposition seemingly humbly, but came to the conclusion that it was impossible to win back power with liberal policies. And so he started to embrace Hungarian nationalism and made it into his new creed. He joined the conservative European People's Party and left his old liberal friends. Since then, he became a liberal hater, a populist, a traditionalist, and spat out his writer friends with whom he had stood on the barricades in 1989. Moreover, he's convinced that the Western model has outrun and that the futurizing copying regimes such as that in China are autocratic leaders like uh, Vladimir Putin or Erdogan. So the man I met for the first time, as a result, of the tearing down of the Iron Curtain and the fall of the Berlin Wall, is now building a fence of concrete and barbed wire himself. 150 kilometers in length, right along the border with Serbia, an act of what I call nationalist aggression, as is the case, I think, with every war. Be it the fence uh, between Israel and Palestine, be it the wall between Mexico and the United States of America. So I left Budapest with a new friend, without knowing at that time that he would later become one of my worst sworn enemies. And the next stop after Budapest was Prague, where the man who was leading the revolt was, if I can tell that, in everything the opposite of Viktor Orban, Vaclav Havel. I saw him personally coming out of the building in December 1989, of Obanske Forum, you remember that, the citizens' movement, who was in the heart of uh, the revolt in uh, Czechoslovakia. And that was the day he was sworn in as the first president of liberated Czechoslovakia. And I followed the huge mass of citizens who walked uh, to Prague Castle, over the Manage Bridge, at the other side of the river, where the ceremony took place. And he came out, I see it before me on the balcony, and I truly felt, I truly felt that I was part of a, a dramatic moment of a historical achievement. And why? Because Havel, uh, dear friends, Havel represent, I think, the best of what's living in all of us, the best of what happened in these crucial days of 1989. He always will remain, I think, the symbol of the fall of an oppressive system that divided our civilization for decades. In fact, he was and continues to be the lonely playwright who defeated the omnipresent state Moloch. My tour ended in the city in which we celebrate today, in Berlin, in East Berlin, of course. Uh, we went straight for the wall that has already started to crumble at that time. I grabbed a cameraman, a big guy like that, a cameraman of uh, working for the Flemish television, and I asked him to help me to cut out a piece of the wall. It was trickier than we had expected, so that was something what in the DDR was done very well, I have to tell you. <laughs> and we managed, nevertheless, to get a piece each. 
And that symbol of liberty, of the liberation of Eastern uh, Europe, of the reunification of Germany, and of our continent is still part of my library today. And of all the content of my bookshelves, it's perhaps the piece I most cherish in my library. So I apologize that I told you in detail my story, personal story, of my first trip to Eastern Europe, uh, because I think uh, uh, to believe that uh, it's important to celebrate events like the fall of the Berlin Wall and to commemorate the victims and to applaud the progress that has been made. But the story that I told you, and in particular the fate and fortunes of Viktor Orban, also shows that progress is fragile that the clock can always be turned back on democracy and on the rule of law, on peace and on prosperity. And Brexit, for example, shows us the fragility of peace in Northern Ireland. And last year, we commemorated 100 years of the end of the First World War, one of the longest and deadliest, deadliest uh, wars in history. 60 million Europeans came under arms. 16 million people died. And it was a war on an industrial scale with chemical warfare, with poison gas, with machine guns, with ethnic cleansing and even genocide. It must, as the Berlin Wall does remember us, how in fact fragile the European project is. It must encourage us to further keep building Europe because standing still, as we are doing now for the moment, means, in fact, that we are losing the progress that has been made by previous generations. It is this willingness to drive Europe forward that is, in my opinion, missing today in European politics in general, but if you allow me, especially in German politics. I'm afraid the inability to see that with great Political power also comes big European responsibility. My feeling is that in 1991, the two big German parties saw the reunification of Germany as an endpoint. And they made the strategic mistake not to use this historic occasion also as the starting point of something new. And the ambitious post-war German willingness to build an ever closer Europe has made place for what I call killing pragmatism, an inspiring realpolitik. And that is neither good for Germany, neither for Europe. Let me take one example to explain that. Take the migration crisis, for example. I commend Chancellor Merkel for her humanity in reacting to this crisis. But unfortunately, it did not resolve the crisis. We schaffen das was a, a national reaction to a European problem. It did nothing to structurally solve the migration crisis. In fact, nothing substantial at all happened over the last couple of years on migration on the European level. People to the shame of Europe are still dying in the Mediterranean. The transformation of Frontex into a European border and coast guard with roughly 10,000 agents has still to start. And the overhaul of the broken Dublin system, you know, uh, the asylum system uh, that is applicable uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe is still far away. The file is simply blocked in the council because there is no unanimity. And the same counts for the reform of the, of the Eurozone, also blocked in the council, which leaves uh, Europe vulnerable to the next financial crisis that will be knocking on our door I fear sooner than later and sooner than we would like. And it's uh, as bad in foreign affairs and in defense, where we are not even capable to come up with a common European answer. For example, to only give one example, a brutal murder on the Saudi journalist Khashoggi against because we lack unanimity. What we need, in fact, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall is to refine the, what I call the spirit and the energy of our European founding fathers. Be it Schumann, be it de Gaspari, be it Monet, be it Spark, but also be it Adenauer, Huys, Kohl, Genscher, 
What they wanted was something completely different than the Europe we see today. They wanted a federal Europe, always choosing the communitarian method over the failing intergovernmental approach based on unanimity. And they wanted an efficient Europe instead of the ineffective confederalism we see today. And I know, I know, I'm aware of it, in European politics, federalism is probably the most misunderstood word of all. European federalism is almost always translated by everybody into a European superstate, while in fact it's quite the opposite. We Belgians, I think also a number of Germans here in the room, know that because federalism is based on subsidiarity. You have to organize the government on the lowest and the smallest political level possible, the closest to the citizen. And a healthy democratic principle is that, I think. And in this spirit, for example, Europe should stay away from overregulating the internal market for the bottles of olive oil in restaurants or the water a toilet flushes. But what we need, definitely need, is more Europe on the big transnational challenges in a world dominated by what I call empires like China, like India, like the Russian Federation, or like the uh, United States of America. Let me give you one example. There is a lot of things about, uh, uh, to do about it uh, since uh, two days ago, yesterday, since Emmanuel Macron has uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, the, the brain debt uh, uh, or the brain problems of uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Take defense. Combined, you know that, the 28 European armies spend about 40 to 45 percent of the American defense budget, which is not bad at all, given the fact that America is the biggest spender in military. But we can do only 10, maybe 12 percent of the operations of the American military. Now, you know I'm only a lawyer, even when I was Minister of Budget, as your UAE called it. But I'm always saying to be Minister of Budget, it's not necessary to know anything about mathematics. Huh? You have to know that. The only thing what you need to know is the word no. That's only what you need to know as the only quality that uh, is required to be a Minister of Budget. But even I, as a lawyer, know that uh, the basic maths that, yeah, if you spend 40, 45 percent of the American defense budget and you can only do 10, 12 percent of the operations of the American Army, that means that you're four times less efficient than the Americans, because the 28 member states do 28 times the same thing. Another example, Europe spent three times more than the Russian Federation on military. Three times more is the budget of Europe compared to the Russian Federation. But I'm pretty sure that we are not capable of defending ourselves without American help. That's the reality of today. And it's true. We have a lot of bilateral and regional corporations. There is the Benelux, there is the Scandinavian Corporation, there is the Baltic Battalion, there is the Franco-German Brigade uh, next to Strasbourg, there is the French-Italian Corporation on Intelligence, and so on, and so on. The list is long. But this inflation of bilateral arrangement is merely papering over the cracks. We are absolutely not using the political uh, potential economies of scale that Europe has to offer. Subsidiarity and federalism means that we are less intrusive with Europe in the things that can be done on the regional, the local, and the national level, but that we do things together where Europe can create an added value. And here lies the added value. So to reconnect with our founding fathers is, in fact, a thing to do. And it's, in my opinion, quite simple. We need, in fact, to abolish three things, what they abolished already in the first constitution of 1953-54. That was not approved uh, by the French National Assembly. A small mistake by the French can happen uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the 50s. We need to make, in fact, three fundamental shifts in order to create a stronger union, a more decisive union, a more democratic union. And that is, first, in my opinion, abolishment of the unanimity rule in all fields, especially naturally in the Council where this unanimity rule is still applicable. 
Secondly, the transformation of an obese European Commission of 28 commissioners into a small, effective European government. If tomorrow, and I'm very much in favor to do that, we do the further enlargement to the Balkan countries, North Macedonia, Albania, but also after tomorrow, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, we will be with how many? 33? Yeah, oh, so we, 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 maybe there will leave somebody, huh? as we know, the UK commissioner. But we'll be with more than 30, 32, 33. I can tell you, we have not even enough competences in Europe to put in portfolios for these people. And third, we need also to end a Europe a la carte where everyone can pick and choose his benefits without taking up its responsibilities. Today, the European Union is like the menu card from a restaurant. You pick and choose your policies. It's not necessary to participate to all of them. And I compare it always to the United States of America. Can you imagine that in the United States of America that exists, that California could say, look, uh, until the midst of the 19th century, we used the Spanish peseta as the currency, the dollar gone. We're going to return to the Spanish peseta. Could you imagine that Texas is saying the FBI, nice organization, but we're going to do it ourselves? Huh? What is exactly happening in Europe? So moreover, I think European citizens, that's my next point, deserve a union that is working also in full transparency, with full rep uh, responsibility, with own resources. Where, for example, polluting industry space for a clean European economy, where, for example, big tech companies can be Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, they are all American or Asian. Uh, that's another big problem of Europe. Uh, that is that uh, in the internet world, we don't exist. We are making the content, they are making the profits. That is more or less the summary of our situation in, uh, in digital. But also, like I say, with own resources. Uh, we need a new reformed Europe in which Europeans get full control of what happens with their life and with their money. Where representatives they elect not only decide on the expenditures, but also on the income of the budget. You have to know the European Parliament is the only parliament worldwide, really the exception, who has no competence on the income. While, in my opinion, uh, at the end of the Middle Ages, European uh, parliaments were created to control the income, to decide on the income that people would give to the king and uh, to the rulers uh, of uh, the country. And uh, we need uh, representatives that are accountable to the people and no longer the shady backroom deals that also on the issues of uh, um, financial contributions, budget, and so on, is now uh, the rule. So we need to build a transparent European government, not only, I think, to guarantee economic efficiency, but also to safeguard Europe's cultural and linguistic uh, diversity, to guarantee, for example, the rule of law and democracy everywhere on our continent. Because let's not make a mistake in the coming years, in the coming, in my opinion, four, five years, just before uh, towards the new European uh, election, uh, it will be uh, a real fight, uh, if I may say so, for the soul of Europe, between those who stand by liberal democracy and those who want an illiberal Europe, an unconstitutional Europe. Yes, in fact, uh, a Europe uh, turning itself in, in racism and xenophobia. So, and that's my conclusion, it will be necessary to continue the fight of brave people like Vaclav Havel and Imre Kertes. And more importantly, the fight of all these brave individual citizens in Eastern Europe, individuals like the ones who showed up at the gates of the Berlin Wall and made uh, Gunter Schabowski stutter and falter. We are now 30 years after the fall of that terrible war that awful Iron Curtain and it's our duty to continue to fight for a free and a strong Europe as the best protection against repeating the mistakes of the past. Thank you very much.
Christian Light. Um, I live in Switzerland. I work for a bank there, you know. So, uh, and I will be a speaker later on. I really enjoyed your speech, and uh, I really enjoyed your analysis. I mean, as a historian, I very much enjoyed your analysis of what happened 30 years ago, and of course of the the analysis of the European Union today. But as a, probably, I don't know, for my sins, eternal optimist, you know, I'd like you to say three things that the European Union is actually doing well at this point in time. Otherwise, I go away very depressed. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But, uh, so, uh, three things that the European Union is doing well. The, the first, uh, let me start with uh, uh, the, the most important one, trade policy today. Uh, we, uh, it's not the accident that we have the biggest surplus uh, uh, today uh, worldwide of all these empires that uh, I was talking uh, about. It's because our, uh, our trade policies that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we have. And uh, the, the trade policies are now conducted in a, in, in a more open way, more transparent way, uh, trying to build uh, a European social and environmental standards in these, three, in these arrangements with Canada, with Japan, uh, uh, and now uh, also being uh, negotiated with uh, uh, in Mercosur and being negotiated with uh, India and with others. So I think that the trade policy is an example that shows very well the way forward and what European cooperation is capable to do so. My second pick will be an old story, the Airbus story, because it's one of the only fields in industrial policy where we got the guts to go for European champions. And where we have beat it at the end, or beat it, so we are in full competition with Boeing, with America, and we can keep up that competition. If Airbus was not created, by the way, an initiative of a British company, it was Hauke Sidley, uh, who said, yeah, we can nothing uh, do again, McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, it's over. Let's work together with the French and with the, the, the Germans on. Uh, on this issue. Let's build a new, and at that moment, the competition authorities didn't see a problem in doing that. And Airbus uh, has been created as a typical European, it's an example eh, for, 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 for Galileo, it's an example for, for, for the success of the single market, but at the same time, I want not to leave you depressed here, I want to tell you that the success of the internal market is a success, but only for 35% of the goods and the services. 65% of the single market is not single market, is not free, is not open, is not harmonized. By accident, all the services of the future are not harmonized. Digital, telecom, capital, energy, that represents 60% of the total activities in Europe and are not in the single market today. And so the success uh, so of Airbus needs to be picked up as an example to set out corporations and opening the market, the single market, to European standards, not only for uh, airplanes, but in the future also for hydrogen, for batteries, for digital, if we want to stop what we have today, that we are colonized, in fact, by the Americans at one hand and tomorrow by the Chinese at the other hand. What is happening today? I, I, I have a slide with me, but you have not a projector here. Eh? So you have one? Uh, could send you uh, two slides to you showing uh, what the stock market value is uh, of the internet platforms at one hand, and there who is making the content. And in the content, I should show you that one third of the content is made by the Europeans, and then I should show you the big balloons of American and Asian companies. I'm now describing my slide. Uh, and, and then a very, you, you need good glasses to see what Europe is. Because the only thing that exists there is SAP, is German company, is in fact an accountancy uh, uh, an accountancy platform uh, that is uh, very popular in Germany uh, in, in, in the industry and so on, but it's the only thing what we have. All the rest is uh, American and, and Asian. So that's my second. And my third one, 
Um, to be, uh, this is, is uh, that I want to give is education Erasmus. Uh, where we have started something that has really, in my opinion, changed the mindset of many young people. I think that if today you go, you see an election, even also in Britain, uh, we're going to see that young people know what Europe is. In fact, young people uh, are disengaged with what I call the classical nationalist uh, paradigmas that existed in, in, in Europe. Erasmus, and we have to enlarge Erasmus, not only university students, all young people need to uh, have uh, Erasmus uh, to, uh, for their uh, disposal. Uh, Erasmus has showed that there is no contradiction to be as I am. I am from Ghent. I am Flemish. I am, live in the state named Belgium. And at the same time, my destiny is Europe. There is no contradiction. Erasmus shows that nationalism based on identity thinking is false, is not true. You, there is no such categorized identity, ah, those who speak German, those who speak Flemish, those who speak this, those who speak that, and that we need to develop policies based on this categorization. The identity of all people is different. There are no two people here in this room with the same identity. Identity are layers, one above the other. And that starts with you're gay or heterosexual, and that continues when you speak that language and that language, or you are a fan of this football club, or you have, no, you have nothing to do with football, you like poetry, or like... Uh, the, that is the... the and, and, and Erasmus uh, is, I think, uh, the best way, and therefore we have to enlarge it, to, to, uh, to see and, and, and to have more young people who are looking uh, itself to, I, be, I am a German, or I am living in, uh, in I don't know what uh, a city uh, of uh, Germany, of another country of the European Union, but I feel European. Because there exists, ladies and gentlemen, a European civilization. And this European civilization is our common ground. It's not true that nationalism has been invented by us, by Europeans, yes? When? At the end of the 18th century, in the, in, in the 19th century, with all the consequences, all the tragedies. But when Goethe, he went to Italy to what? To discover Europe. And Montaigne, before him, did the same. Europe exists. There is a European civilization. If you go from the Atlantic, in France there, in Britannia, far away, and you go until the Volga, so that's far, eh? I take already a part of Russia now in, uh, in European civilization, but it's true. Until the Volga, you will see the same architecture. You will see the same uh, literature. And uh, those people were saying, yeah, but uh, that is impossible to govern. Uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way, I'm always saying, yeah, but how, uh, take for example India. Uh, people are looking to India, but India, you know how many nations there are? 2,000 nations. You know how many uh, languages that are spoken in uh, India? 20. How many religions they have? Four. And you're the biggest democracy. I, I don't say that uh, we have to copy whatsoever. No, we have to develop our own model, our own uh, idea. But I think that uh, uh, federal thinking, subsidiarity, and, 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 uh, and, and, and using the civil, European civilization as the basis for our uh, political model is the way forward. And if we don't do it, my prediction is that this European Union will not survive the 21st century. Because after Brexit, there will be what didn't happen. Eh? That didn't happen, Brexit, the Danish going out. That didn't happen, uh, the, the next year, the Dutch going out, and the Frexit, it was all predicted huh, that it will, will happen. It's the opposite that happened. The opposite. People, after Brexit, have said, look, we are so very critical towards the European Union, but we are not so stupid as the Brits to go out. That is mainly what people are thinking. Their criticism towards Europe is still higher maybe than a year or two years ago, 
but their belief in the project is higher than ever before. And it's, that is what we need to do. That's the task of politicians, that not of diplomats. Uh, um, diplomats can help also uh, a little bit uh, in this. That is to match again the project, the vision, with uh, the translation of that vision, the union as it works. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I would like you to expand a little more. What to do with Orban? <laughs> what to do with Victor Orban? How do we cope with the, the Ill illiberal democracies in the European Union? And in connection with that, the uh, decision from uh, President Macron and other countries to, to stop negotiations with uh, Albania and uh, Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, wouldn't it be better if we actually uh, uh, created a mechanism where we could deal with illiberal Ill democracies inside the European Union instead of stopping uh, negotiations with, with new countries where we have the same fear, of course, that they could at some point be illiberal demo democracies? Uh, my, my answer is very short. To uh, the union. But once you are in the union, you can do what you want. Oh, what? Copenhagen criteria disappear uh, like uh, that. So the, the, you need a mechanism to scrutinize in all 28 countries, so there are yes. not only problems in Poland and in Hungary, in all 28 countries, and that on a regular basis. That will be done. The EU Commission will come forward with a proposal, a mechanism in which we are not using alone Article 7, but uh, in which we, uh, with, who, with, with, uh, with that mechanism, it will be possible to scrutinize all 28 and to make a yearly as, uh, uh, assessment of what is happening. And then, three, it, based on such an assessment, you need to take action. Action is, for example, uh, that uh, money is not longer going uh, to a number of projects that are, in fact, decided by this country who are breaching uh, the, 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 the... That doesn't mean that... that that money uh, is lost for the people. We need to find a system in which that people, uh, it, that money is reserved uh, for the citizens, but taken out of the hands of those who are in breach uh, with, uh, uh, with that new mechanism that we will create. So I'm quite optimistic that in the coming years, so uh, not to be depressed, uh, <laughs> uh, not too much, uh, I'm quite optimistic that, that this can be achieved in the coming uh, two, three years. There is a, in the council, in the, in the parliament, a quite uh, unanimous uh, uh, view on it to uh, create such a, uh, a pan-European, I should say, uh, uh, mechanism uh, the fastest uh, as, uh, as possible. And uh, on the issue of further enlargement, I've given you my opinion about it, uh, I think that uh, there is no problem at further enlargement if we put also our house in order. So we cannot make the mistake as we did uh, in the past, where we, we, we I think it was the only good thing to do in, 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 after 1989 was to put uh, the new, uh, uh, these new countries inside the European family. But we have forgotten really to, uh, to do everything what is necessary uh, to, to deepen uh, the European uh, view. And to deepen the European Union, I have given only a few of this. Uh, of this example, the, the main point is the end of unanimity rule. I know people can go out of the room and say, why is he talking about unanimity rule? That's an institutional question. But you have to know institutional issues matter. Matter. It's, there is a, 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 a good book of, uh, of two Americans, Akamura and Robinson, Why Nations Fail. Maybe you have already uh, the, uh, read that, and certainly in, in yeah. This institute that will be one of them. Uh, okay, what is the, what, what, they are, what they are saying? It's not economic stupid, it's politics stupid. That's the main <laughs> message of the book. Uh, it's the good institutions will create good results. Bad institutions, bad results. Not so difficult to see that worldwide. <laughs> well, 
We have not good institutions. That's the point. We have a number of institutional problems, and that create bad results. And so, if you want to change the bad results, you have to know that you need to change your institutions. <laughs> and that's so difficult, because if you talk about institutions in the Europe, I'm not thinking, oh, institutions, institutions. Uh, he's there again to talk about the constitution, the treaty, the this, the that. Yeah, because that is a problem. And if you don't recognize that it is a problem, then you are blind. And that's not good in politics to be blind. Thank you very much. About immigration, you were critical of the German Chancellor's policies in that regard, if I understood you well. And my question is, what really should be done for the time being? As you said, there is ab absolutely no European Union uh, um, border management, but there is the Schengen Treaty, which provides free travel within the Schengen area, but no management of the outside border. So uh, did you mean this, that it would be irrational and the problematic to enforce open borders policies uh, in the absence of uh, a bo efficient border management? Is, would that be your point of critique of the uh, lack of any success of the German Chancellor's uh, uh, policies in terms of migration, if I understood you well, since 2015? Yeah. to a European problem, and the European problem is still there. And we need to make an agreement with Mr. Erdogan uh, to more or less uh, manage that uh, uh, problem. And that uh, you are fully right, it's the, 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 the problem of migration is a typical problem of the way we conceive things in Europe. We start with Europe, and then after a few years, the financial crisis, oh shit. Actually, excuse me that I will use that one. We don't have this, we don't have that, we don't. We are still working after this financial crisis to complete the banking union. Huh? The European Stability Mechanism uh, in Europe has published a calendar a few weeks ago that probably we will have it in 2028, huh? the banking union. 20 years after the outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a problem. We, the same with Schengen. We start with Schengen normally. The first thing to do if you start with Schengen is what? Is a, a common border uh, management? No? That seems to me logic. Now, that's not typical of Europe. Europe is different. Huh? We are smarter than that. We start with a policy and then we say, oh, I, we missed something. Uh, and we have to change that mentality. It's first, we have to be sure if we launch ourselves in new policies in action that we have the instruments in place and then to launch a policy. Mm -hmm. And not to count, as we do for the moment, for example, in Eurozone, oh, the European Central Bank will solve it. Don't look, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. That's what is happening for the moment in, uh, in, 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 in Eurozone policy, and uh, for example, the migration. And on migration, I agree fully with you, that doesn't exist today in European policy, because Dublin is the negation of, you, of, 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 Europe, of European policies. It is saying, Bulgaria, do it yourself. Greece, do it yourself. Italy, do it yourself. Uh, Spain, uh, do it uh, uh, yourself. That doesn't mean that all these people do, uh, never arrive in Europe, but they arrive in Europe. Huh? And so, changing that is absolutely me. What is now, again, the problem? <laughs> so, I'm going to repeat myself. It's because the, the Member States have decided that on the change and the reform, normally in the treaty, uh, changing uh, Dublin is qualified majority, yeah? but in their wisdom, European Council has decided it's so important that we need to do that with unanimity. And since then, already three years, two years, two years and a half, this file is blocked while the European Parliament has a position, has a proposal, very concrete, also with a, a solidarity mechanism, and so on and so on, to manage this new asylum system. And the same is happening 
for the European border and coast guard. You know what the member states are saying when uh, we vote for a huge budget for the European border and coast guard? Hey, we have a budget proposal. Give that money to us. We go and do it. That is not what we want. We need uh, European capacity. So I applaud what Mrs. Merkel has done. Otherwise, that's what I said also in my text. But it, let's not forget that the real uh, approach to such problem needs to be European and, 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 and not uh, national uh, anymore. So um, that's my, my answer. Uh, I think that migration for the moment is, a, is, a, uh, is, is, is certainly also something fueling nationalism, fueling populism. And if we don't get it right, between now and 2024, we're going to see the return of nationalists and populists far bigger, more massive than we have seen ever in the past. And that's my fear. That is that will we not, uh, will we use the spirit of time now in the coming three, four years to do what is necessary? And if we don't do it, uh, we would be, we could be responsible uh, for something that nobody else wants. Sorry for the depression. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Guy Rossa.